Hello everyone, I'm Sean Esterly with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. Welcome to today's webinar, which is being hosted by the Clean Energy Solutions Center in partnership with the Renewable Energy Policy Network for the 21st Century, also known as REN21. And today's webinar is focused on the launch of REN21's flagship report, Renewables 2014 Global Status Report, with a special focus on Africa. One important note of mention before we begin our presentations is that the Clean Energy Solutions Center does not endorse or recommend specific products or services. Information provided in this webinar is featured in the Solutions Center's resource library as one of many best practices resources reviewed and selected by technical experts. And I just want to go over some of the webinar features that you have for today. For audio, you do have two options. You may either listen through your computer or call in by telephone. And if you choose to listen to your computer, please select the mic and speakers option in the audio pane. Doing so will eliminate the possibility of feedback and echo. And if you choose to dial in by phone, please select the telephone option. And then a box on the right side will display the telephone number and also the audio pin that you should use to dial in. And panelists, we ask that you please mute your audio device while you are not presenting. And if anyone's having technical difficulties with the webinar, you can contact the GoToWebinar's help desk number. That number is displayed at the bottom of the slide, and it is 888-259-3826. And we encourage people from the audience to submit questions at any point um, as you have them. And so to do that, simply go to the questions pane in the GoToWebinar uh, and type it in and submit it there. And also, if you're having difficulty viewing the materials through the webinar portal, you will find PDF copies of the presentations at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training, and you may follow along as the speakers present. And we'll also be posting an audio recording of the presentations in the webinar to that site within about a week of today's broadcast. Uh, in addition, we are now adding webinars to the Solution Center YouTube channel, where you will find other informative webinars, as well as video interviews with uh, some thought leaders on clean energy policy topics. Now, today's webinar agenda is centered around the presentations from our guest panelists, Laura Williamson, Angsar King, and Kevin Nassett. And these distinguished panelists have been kind enough to join us to discuss the launch of REN21's flagship report, Renewables 2014 Global Status Report. In this 90-minute webinar, we'll look in detail at Africa, and we will find out what renewable changes happened in Africa over the course of 2013. We'll learn which technologies are contributing to increased power capacity, and hear how changes in policies have affected African investment levels and market development. And before our speakers begin their presentations, I'll provide a short informative overview of the Clean Energy Solutions Center initiative. And then following the presentations, we will have a question and answer session where the panelists will address questions submitted by the audience, and then some closing remarks and brief survey. A slide provides a bit of background in terms of how the Solution Center came to be formed. And the Solution Center is one of 13 initiatives under the Clean Energy Ministerial that was launched in April 2011 and is primarily led by Australia, the U.S., and other CEM partners. And some of the unique outcomes of this initiative include support of developing countries and emerging economies through enhancement of resources and policies relating to energy access, no-cost expert policy assistance, and peer-to-peer -peer learning and training tools such as the webinar um, we're attending today. And there's four primary goals for the Solution Center. First goal is to serve as a clearinghouse of clean energy policy resources. Second is to share policy best practices, data, and analysis tools specific to clean energy policies and programs. And third, the Solution Center delivers dynamic services that enable expert assistance, learning, and peer-to-peer -peer sharing of experiences. And then lastly, the Center fosters dialogue on emerging policy issues and innovation around the globe. Now, our primary audience are uh, energy policymakers and analysts from governments and technical organizations uh, throughout the world. But then we also strive to engage with the private sector, NGOs, and civil society. And one of the marquee features that the Solution Center provides is its no-cost expert policy assistance, which is known as Ask an Expert. And the Ask an Expert program has established a broad team of over 30 experts from around the globe who are available to provide remote policy advice and analysis to all countries at no cost. So, for example, in the area of buildings, we're very pleased to have Cesar Trevino, leader of the Mexico Green Building Council, serving as one of our experts. So if you have a need for policy assistance in buildings, renewable energy, energy efficiency, 
or any other clean energy sector, we do encourage you to use this uh, valuable service. Again, it is provided to you free of charge. And to request assistance, uh, simply go to cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash expert, and you can register through the Ask an Expert form there. We also invite you to spread the word about this service to those in your networks and organizations. And so in summary, we uh, encourage you to explore and take advantage of the Solution Center resources and services, which include the Expert Policy Ask an Expert Service, the uh, Database of Clean Energy Policy Resources. Subscribe to the newsletter to learn about new developments, uh, new training opportunities, and then participate in webinars like this one. And so now I would like to provide uh, introductions for today's distinguished panelists. The first speaker that we'll be hearing from is Laura Williamson. And Laura is the Communication Outreach Manager of REN21. And she will be discussing key findings from the REN21 Renewables 2014 Global Status Report. And then following Laura, we will hear from Angsara Kien, and a Senior Program Manager at Greenpeace, uh, where he's heading the Greenpeace Sustainable Energy for All, also known as c for all program. And then our final presenter today is Kevin Nassif, the CEO of the South African National Energy Research Institute. And so uh, now, with those introductions, I would like to welcome Laura to the webinar. Hello. Hello, thank you very much. Um, as uh, Sean mentioned, my name is Laura Williamson, and I'm with REN21. And what I'm going to do today is give you um, a, a brief overview of the current status of renewables in the world today, with a few specific examples uh, about Africa, which will then be further complemented by Angsar and Kevin. But before we begin, you know, who is REN21? REN21 is a multi-stakeholder network that cuts across five key stakeholder groups trade associations, nonprofits, governments, intergovernmental organizations, and research institutes. And from these five stakeholder groups, we have about 500 experts on renewable energy that come together to help REN21 produce this annual global status report. So where do we stand uh, 10 years on since Bonn 2004? As some of you may remember, Bonn 2004 was the first international renewable energy conference that focused purely on renewables. 10 years on now, we can definitely say that the renewable power capacity has increased sevenfold around the world. That's excluding hydropower. Most technology costs have decreased significantly, and supporting policies continue to spread throughout the world. Numerous scenarios that projected uh, levels of, for renewable energy growth for 2020 were actually surpassed by 2010. And we've also seen some of the positive knock-on effects, the additionality that renewable energies um, can bring to a country through the use of improved energy security, the mitigation of greenhouse gas gases, and also direct um, environmental and social benefits, um, notably job creation. So I think it's fairly safe to say that uh, renewables are here, they're a viable option, and now the challenge really is how can we best increase the current pace of renewable energy uptake to um, accelerate and achieve 100% renewables. So where do, we, where do we stand today? Um, we can see that the renewable energy share in the world for final energy consumption um, has remained relatively level with uh, 2011 levels. Uh, this is in part because despite the rapid growth in modern renewables, it's been tempered by the slow migration away from traditional biomass and from the continued rise into global energy demand. Keeping in mind, we're talking about the Sustainable Energy for All initiative that was launched by Ban Ki-moon um, in New York, the Sustainable Energy for All Forum. Um, the objective of this initiative, which is applied uh, globally, is to um, double the share of renewable energy by 2030 from 2010 levels, which means increasing from 18% to 36%. However, in order to reach this, um, in 
increased efforts renewable energy deployment are needed, as well as more action in the field of energy efficiency to curb demand. And if we really look at the breakdown of uh, the renewable energy sources, we see that we actually need a tripling of clean renewable energy if we are to move away from the unsustainable use of biomass. If we look at renewable energy, um, renewable energy by, by country, we can see that absolute figures, China, US, Japan, are still leading in the field. However, if we look at it relative um, investment relative to GDP, we see a different picture. That's the second line on your screen. And here we're starting to see emergence of developing countries, which is a very clear indicator um, that there is a rapid advancement of renewable energy in developing countries. If we look at total capacity by technology, we see a slightly, um, a slightly different picture with the breakdown ranging um, across the globe. When it comes to uh, total renewable capacity installed per capita, the EU is, is leading, the European Union is leading. 42% uh, of global non-hydro renewable capacity is in Europe, compared to less than 17% of global electricity demand. These high uh, renewable shares also explain the need for increased attention on the integration of variable renewables in the energy system. Looking at the various energy sectors, uh, if we look at the power sector, we can see that there's, this is where the most significant uh, growth has occurred. Global renewable power capacity has, exceeds um, 1,560 gigawatts. And there's been an increase of more than 8% over 2012. In 2013, renewables accounted for more than 50% of net additions to global power capacity and represented far higher shares of capacity added in, in several countries. We're seeing um, that variable renewables achieved high levels of penetration um, in several countries. Uh, by way of example, um, in 2013, wind power met 33.2% uh, and 20.9% of electricity demand in Denmark and Spain, respectively. We saw solar in Italy, solar PV met 7.8% of its total annual electricity demand. And a, a striking figure is that in 2013, China's new renewable power capacity surpassed new fossil fuel and nuclear capacity for the first time. Heating and cooling um, was up by about uh, 10%. Heat from modern biomass, solar, and geothermal sources accounts for a small but, but gradually rising share of the final global heat demand. The use of modern renewable technologies for heating and cooling is still limited, however, relative to their vast potential. There are some encouraging best practices. Uh, we see in Denmark, for example, um, has now banned the use of fossil fuel fired boilers in new buildings that was starting in 2013 and they aim now for renewables to provide almost 40 percent of the total heat supply by by 2020. An African example uh, we're seeing that in uh, South Africa renewables met six percent of the final energy demand for heat. In transport uh, we see that uh, liquid biofuels met around just over 2% 2, 2 of total transport fuel demand. There is a, a growing um, interest in other renewable options in the transport sector. Uh, and what we're also seeing is you know, limited but increasing initiatives to link electric transport systems with renewable energy, particularly at the city and regional levels. Uh, this also is in part um, perhaps one one way of resolving potential conflict around land use for fuel versus food issues. If we give a, a quick look by technology, uh, we can see that about 40 uh, gigawatts of new hydro capa hydropower capacity was commissioned in 2013, increasing the total global capacity around 4% to approximately 1,000 gigawatts. 
Um, we've got modernization of aging hydropower facilities in a growing global market. And we're starting to see a trend in, in some countries towards smaller reservoir and multi-turbine uh, run of river projects. What, what is good to see is an increasing recognition of the potential of hydropower to complement other renewable technologies such as variable wind and solar power. <coughs> Support for uh, future hydropower development in Africa is growing uh, with many potential sites and we're seeing uh, trans-border interconnections for hydropower um, being launched between Ethiopia and Kenya. If we look at um, solar PV, this was a record year for, for solar PV in 2013, adding just under 40 uh, for gigawatts, um, coming up to a total of approximately 139 gigawatts. And what's remarkable about this, aside from the numbers, is that for the first time ever, more PV capacity was added than wind capacity. China saw spectacular growth, uh, accounting for nearly one-third of global capacity, and they were followed by Japan and the U.S. Solar PV is starting to play a substantial role in electricity generation in some countries, particularly in Europe, and with lower prices, we're seeing an opening of new markets um, in Africa and the Middle East, as well as in some parts of Asia and Latin America. Um, as I mentioned, the lower prices um, are opening new markets in, in Africa, and one of the, the continent's largest markets to date is, is South Africa, and this is something that Kevin will talk in more detail about in his presentation. Um, and this has been, um, a lot of the PV has been procured under a government uh, bidding process and connected the first plant of about 75 megawatts to the grid in 2013. Ethiopia um, has the first, its first module manufacturing facility and has begun to supply the domestic market. So it's expected to see um, big increases um, in the subcontinent over the next coming years. Looking now at um, wind power. Uh, more than 35 gigawatts of wind power capacity was added in 2013 for a total above 380 gigawatts. Despite this growth, the market was down nearly 10 gigawatts compared to 2012, um, reflect, reflecting primarily a steep drop in the U.S. market. Offshore wind had a, had a record year with 1.6 gigawatts added. Almost all of this, however, was um, located in the European Union. China saw wind generating 140 billion kilowatt hours uh, in, in 2013, which was up 40% over 2012 levels and has exceeded nuclear generation for the second year running. Wind power, you know, with regards to an African context, um, wind power has a foothold in Africa. Um, however, there is a shortage of skilled uh, personnel to, to support rapid growth. Looking now at bioenergy, <coughs> sorry, not bioenergy, excuse me, concentrating solar power, um, we see that uh, global CSP was up nearly um, just under one gigawatt, 36% in 2013. Uh, while the, the U.S. and Spain remain the market leaders, uh, markets continue to shift to developing countries with high levels of um, insulation. So we're starting to see beyond the leading markets, we're getting a, a tripling of of capacity with projects coming online in the United Arab Emirates, um, in India, and in China. There's an increasing range of hybrid CSP applications. Uh, thermal energy storage has also continued to gain in importance. The industry operations have expanded into, into new markets, and, and global growth in the sector remains strong, but we're seeing that revised, a revised uh, growth uh, projections and competition from solar PV has led uh, to a number of companies actually closing their CSP operations. The, we are still seeing a trend toward um, larger plants to basically take advantage of economies of scale while improving the design and manufacturing techniques um, helped to reduce costs. The CSP market did expand significantly across Africa and the Middle East. Um, in the UAE, the United Arab Emirates, we saw the 100 megawatt Shams 1 plant. 
there was investment, commitment of investment of over 600 million US dollars to support markets in Algeria, Egypt, Jordan, Libya, Morocco, and Tunisia to help bring more than uh, one gigawatt of CSP to the regional market. And we're seeing um, construction occurring mostly in North Africa, um, construction underway in Morocco and Egypt with planned construction in Saudi Arabia and Kuwait. If we look now at um, bioenergy, we see that demand cont continues to grow in this sector, um, both heat, power, and transport sectors. The total primary energy consumption of biomass reached approximately 57 exajoules in 2013, of which almost 60% was traditional biomass, um, and the, re the rest was what we call modern bioenergy, um, solid gases and liquid fuels. Heating was what accounted for the majority of biomass use. Um, global biopower capacity was up by an estimated 5 gigawatts to 88 gigawatts. And uh, we're starting to see, I mean not starting, but Europe is continuing to be the world's largest consumer of modern bioheat. Um, it's also the largest consumer of wooden pellets burning over 15 million tons in 2013. Geothermal, um, sort of as this steady additions, 530 megawatts of new geothermal generating capacity came online in 2013. Um, accounting for, for replacements, the net increase was about uh, 455 megawatts, uh, bringing the total glo global capacity to, to 12 gigawatts. And this net capacity growth of 4% compares to an average growth rate of about 3% for the two previous years. Solar heating and thermal um, of particular interest in um, the Africa region. Solar, water, and air collector capacity exceeded um, over 280 gigawatts in 2012 and reached an estimated 330 gigawatt um, by the end of 2013. As in the past years, China was the main demand driver, accounting for more than 80% of the global market. Demand in key European markets continued to slow, but markets expanded in other countries such as Brazil, where solar thermal heating is, is cost competitive. The trend towards deploying large domestic systems continued, as did growing interest in the use of thermal, tech, thermal technologies for district heating, cooling, and industrial applications. If we look now at the contribution of renewables to the employment sector, we can see that growth continued. Job creation, um, thankfully, has come to the forefront of the policy-making debate. Um, globally now, we have an estimated 6.5 million people working directly or indirectly in the renewable energy sector, which is up um, a million from the previous year. The bulk number of employment um, still remains concentrated in a few countries, namely China, Brazil, the US, India, and Bangladesh, and some EU countries, but it is expanding in other parts of the world. Uh, China still remains the largest employer in the sector, with 60% um, of employment concentrated in the solar PV sector. And here we're starting to see a shift um, towards jobs in the installation segment of the value chain. By way of another example, um, in South Korea, there was uh, a, a million new green jobs created um, by promoting some major green technologies in that, in that area. Looking at global investment in uh, renewable energy, um, we saw that investment was down uh, for the second consecutive year. This was in part due to uncertainty over incentive policies. Um, in Europe and the US, um, as well as to uh, retroactive reductions in support in some countries. But also it was due to the reduction in technology costs, as we'll see in the next slide. However, despite this, this decline, um, net investment in new renewable power capacity outpaced fossil fuels for the fourth year running. 
So we're looking, you know, if we look specifically at the, the PV sector, we can see that um, even though global investment in solar PV declined nearly 22% uh, relative to 2012, new capacity installations increased by more than 32%. These steep uh, cost reductions throughout the last years, as we've seen in wind and PV, make uh, renewables attractive for new markets in developing countries where there is a strong need for new electricity generation capacities and where energy demand is increasing. This slide here shows, uh, shows investment by region. Um, despite, as I mentioned before, the, the downward trend, um, there were significant exceptions at the country level. So, for example, uh, Europe's renewable energy investment was down 44% uh, from 2012. Um, there was a decline in China's investment. However, for the first time, as I mentioned um, at the start of my presentation, China invested more in renewable energy um, than did all of Europe combined, and it invested more in renewable power capacity than in fossil fuels. 2013 brought a, a clear shift in investment, moving east to Asia and Oceania, um, excluding India and China, as well as to the Americas. Um, excluding the U.S. and Brazil. The most notable area was, was Japan, where investment in renewable energy, excluding R&D, research and development, uh, increased 80% relative to 2012 levels. South Africa, if we look at um, Africa, South Africa was the eighth uh, largest investor in renewables, with just under um, 5 billion U.S. dollars excluding uh, research and development. Kenya was the second largest investor, followed by Mauritius and Burkina Faso. We turn now to the renewable energy policy landscape. We've seen lots of positive uh, developments um, across the globe with regards to um, targets and uh, support policies. So by Early 2014, at least 144 countries had renewable energy targets, and 138 countries had renewable energy support policies in place. Developing and emerging economies have led the expansion in recent years, and now account for 95 of the countries with support policies in place, which is up from 15 in 2005. As in, as in past years, most renewable energy policies enacted or revised during 2013 focus on the power sector. So we have things such as feed-in tariffs, uh, renewable portfolio standards are, are the most popular instruments. Public competitive bidding or tendering um, is growing, with a number of countries turning to public auctions. There was an increase um, from about 9 in 2008 nine to 55 as of early 2014. Targets and policies supporting renewable energy heating and cooling are also steadily increasing. In 13, 19 countries had heat obligations or mandates in place. Um, with regards to transport, we see 63 countries had implemented policies to promote the production or consumption of biofuels for transport. <coughs> Particularly, um, if we're looking sort of what happened in the African continent in 2013, we've got some, some interesting developments. Um, ECOWAS has put in place, ECOWAS being a West African region, has put in place some transnational targets. Uh, we see the revision and expansion of feed-in tariffs in South Africa and Uganda, while Ghana established rates for a feed-in tariff scheme which was adopted in 2011. Um, Egypt launched a tender for the first solar PV plant, and South Africa set dates for the third round of its concentrating solar power tenders. Zimbabwe raised a mandate um, from E5 to E10, and South Africa set, um, set a date to implement E2 and B5 mandates. This is for um, biofuels. And we also saw that South Africa adopted um, incentives to promote domestic electric vehicle industry. 
If we look now quickly at distributed um, renewable energy, uh, we're seeing that energy access and the use of distributed renewable energy technologies increased. Um, on all developing continents except Africa, the growth in population electrified is bigger than the growth in, t in total population. In Africa, however, the population growth rate um, exceeded the rate of electrification, and there is still only about 43% of the population that is electrified. New business models, um, new finance models for rural energy markets are emerging as the potential of the renewable energy market is, is being re recognized. Um, also thanks to uh, technical advances, um, we're enabling the integration of mini grids and ICT application for power management and end user services. Africa is, is currently still home to half of the world's population without access to electricity. But there are a lot of initiatives taking place, and, and both Angsar and, and Kevin will, will talk more in detail about those. Just a few way of, of some examples about of what's happening in the region. In 2013, the Africa Clean Cooking Energy Solutions Initiative was established to, pro, to promote enterprise-based large-scale dissemination and adoption of clean cooking solutions in sub-Saharan Africa. And currently, there are about 130 stakeholders from, from 26 African countries participating in that initiative. South Africa is among the leading countries for large-scale off-grid renewable energy um, programs to promote energy access and sustainability. And we now have electrification targets in Botswana, Ethiopia, Ghana, Mali, Rwanda, South Africa, Tanzania, and Zimbabwe. So where do we stand after that whirlwind tour? of the current status of renewables in the world today. Um, I think it's fairly safe to say that global perceptions um, have shifted considerably with regards to renewables. As you can see on the cover of the New Yorker here, where you sort of have the blend of everyday life um, alongside, uh, alongside renewables. And although, you know, the figures, so, so today renewables have sort of arrived as the mainstream and are preferred, are the preferred energy option um, for many of the general public th throughout the world. I think that um, sort of as by way of conclusion and to lead into the other, the other presenters is that the barriers now are really not uh, technological or financial but really are more political. And if we're serious about um, facilitating an, an, an energy transition with renewables, there really needs to be much more closer collaboration between all actors from the public and private sectors if this is going to be a reality. So with that, I will, I will close. If you are interested in getting more information about the Global Status Report, please consult our website. It's the first website um, listed, Renewables 2014 Global Status Report. There you will find the report available in an online reader format, easy reading format, or in a downloadable um, PDF. So I encourage you to consult it and to please come back to us at the Secretariat if you have any questions, um, additions, or are interested in participating in our data collection process. Thank you very much. Yes, welcome everyone and uh, thanks uh, Laura for this uh, informative top line overview. Um, it's always, uh, I'm always looking forward for the Global Status Report <coughs> to give us a reality check because uh, often the reality is outpacing the predictions and, um, and with this report everyone knows where we are in terms of renewables and uh, let me um, stick uh, for my presentation with a bird's eye view um, now shifting to the African continent and uh, I'd like Heather to uh, continue with the next slide please. Um, so why are we focusing so much attention on renewables uh, especially when it comes to our uh, African continent? Um, well, with this uh, illustration, uh, I'd like to, to highlight um, the opportunity to turn um, a devastating 
uh, situation uh, when it comes to electrification rate on the African continent, we just heard uh, from Laura, um, something like 500 plus million um, citizens on the African continent still uh, without access to electricity. Uh, how we can turn that into an opportunity? Um, and, and the case I'm trying to make here is that we should look in the past uh, at the analogy with the telecom sector that uh, the majority of people on the African continent uh, were deprived of uh, any uh, modern communication technology by means of telephone because it was uh, uh, far too difficult, too expensive uh, and not perceived as a business case to uh, lay out a network uh, of uh, landlines across uh, often vast uh, sizes of, of countries, uh, not mentioning uh, cross-border. So, um, but what happened is that uh, with a technology revolution by means of uh, mobile communication being developed, uh, aided by uh, supportive legislation um, to allow um, yeah, private companies to enter the communication, telecommunication market, uh, these people who were pre deprived of, uh, of communication were now offered a reliable service uh, which surprisingly to, to many of, uh, of the community were willing and able to pay for those uh, reliable services. And so I see a lot of uh, analogies to the current uh, energy situation that um, uh, the business as usual uh, has not been able to serve uh, the demand, the energy demand of, of the African population. Um, but now, where are we? We've, we've heard that uh, the renewable energy technology has matured, um, that uh, what is needed now is a supportive legal framework um, to enable independent power producers to provide the people with the energy services that are currently uh, lacking. And uh, again, last um, analogy to the telecoms, um, we are pretty sure that the people are willing and able to pay for reliable energy services as long as there is someone coming uh, to provide them with them. And we say, uh, the opportunity is there to provide them with renewable, sustainable energy right from scratch. Um, and, and that's an opportunity that we are, we are seeing. Uh, next, please. So, again, um, looking at the, at the broader picture of, um, of the development debate, um, we gladly recognize that the international community uh, is appreciating the uh, huge impact of access to energy on um, yeah, every, every year of our daily life. And um, it has been highlighted that uh, the, the water, food and energy nexus is something that um, needs to be considered when we're talking about the whole issue of sustainable development. And uh, so you can see it in that graph clearly that uh, people who are concerned about energy are also rate um, water development, sustainability and food quite high. And um, Laura mentioned it already, the um, UN Sustainable Energy for All initiative uh, is pursuing access to sustainable energy for all by 2030. And uh, we are seeing now that the um, drafting of the sustainable development goals, um, which will be the successor of the Millennium Development Goals, are likely to adapt a goal um, on energy which is close to the goals of the Sustainable Energy for All uh, initiative. And um, I mean, we can argue uh, that uh, the lacking goal of access to energy uh, was a reason for not achieving um, many of the um, Millennium Development Goals. However, if we now have a separate energy goal in the Sustainable Energy uh, debate, that might not be the ideal scenario as well. What might be something that, that works out is if in every development aspect we are looking where is the link to energy and, uh, and by uh, reflecting um, the access to energy in, in health and education, uh, sustainable development goals, we might be able to sustain them. Um, so next please. Again, 
why, why are we so concerned about access to uh, energy on the African continent? A recent um, poll by the African Development Bank among the business community clearly highlights that um, the lack of access to reliable electricity is uh, the number one obstacle um, to the private sector in uh, setting up businesses on the African continent. And um, if, we, if, if we see that and we know the importance of the private sector in providing jobs, especially for the, um, for the growing youth population, um, then we know that lack of access to energy is, it can be seen as a time bomb because young people need to communicate, young people need to see uh, a business perspective, need to see um, a perspective for their life and um, if private sector is, uh, is not providing um, those those opportunities because uh, they fear that without um, sustainable provision of electricity their business will not run, then I think um, countries will have to wake up uh, to provide that electricity. Uh, with the next slide we are again seeing why providing access to electricity and access to renewable energy is, is so uh, crucial when we when and why the focus on the African continent if we look at the world map that clearly indicates that our focus needs to go towards the African continent and uh, despite improvements um, in several countries which have uh, been um, working on the on the energy access issue the the electrification rates are still appallingly low and um, that is mainly due to the um, we are still business as usual system that is that is in place in many thinking of the uh, political elite in the uh, economic and political decision makers that a centralized uh, production and consumption pattern and distribution pattern of electricity is still the model to go with but if we re reflect the last 50 years that business as usual has not provided um, the uh, envisioned results in terms of energy access, so why should they work uh, in the future? So a rethinking of the business as usual is necessary as well in regards to the next slide which shows the um, correlation of energy access and the human development index. So again an indication why focusing on um, energy provision is so crucial to long-term sustainable development uh, because if you if you overlap those two uh, graphs from the African continent it clearly shows that countries with a higher electrification rate rate higher in the human uh, development index so this it's a clear correlation of those two and um, yeah decision makers have to be aware of the fact that if they are drafting long-term visions and plans development plans for their country and energy access is not a cornerstone of that concept that is, is most likely to fail on the long run and um, so these, uh, these graphics clearly illustrate that. If you look at the um, next uh, graph we illustrate the, um, the correlation to the climate change because uh, again we see an opportunity that um, the producers of CO2 emissions based on uh, energy consumption uh, are seen in the north and the African continent um, due to its low level of uh, energy consumption per capita um, contributed um, very very little to uh, the issue of climate change uh, which now could result in positively uh, advocacy work for uh, climate finance to finance energy access on the African continent. And with the next slide we'll see that uh, as I mentioned before some countries uh, have made strides in providing access to energy. However, one might question um, who governments often have in mind when targeting to provide uh, energy access. Uh, for example, in South Africa 60% uh, of electricity is consumed by mining and industry and uh, that, that again uh, fosters uh, the business as usual 
where you have a centralized production and and ideally you know in the uh, utility uh, thinking ideally only a handful of big uh, consumers namely mining and industry which you have lucrative contracts with and um, uh, the the general population is missing out so this this picture is can can be attributed to many countries in the global south which is the civil society asking itself yeah energy for whom for what um, and so we have to be a bit um, mm, careful when we look into electricity production figures and, and energy access into really who is benefiting from it and uh, especially when you look at large-scale production from hydro for example who is, is benefiting at the end from the electricity produce. So there's, um, there's continued effort and necessary to remind the utilities and the political decision makers in uh, an, an equal opportunity approach and um, with that I'd like to come to a quick snapshot uh, with the next slide which we've heard already some from Laura I just uh, summarize it that uh, it is it is uh, promising to see that uh, a variety of technologies renewable energy technologies are being utilized in uh, more and more African countries uh, which is exactly the nature of renewable energy sources that they occur uh, in different regions and um, and that is as well aiding energy independence if a country is harnessing its uh, indigenous renewable energy sources and ideally adding it to a mix of them then your economy and your uh, society will be more uh, stable against fluctuation for example uh, of um, of oil prices if you only concentrate on that one uh, energy source um, so we've we've already heard that uh, CSP um, mainly utilized in uh, northern Africa with uh, Morocco trying to to uh, portray itself really as the champion for renewables on the African continent uh, followed now by South Africa which has a, a perfect uh, concentrated solar power uh, regime uh, we're seeing more countries uh, moving into the uh, wind uh, arena which is um, as well a very positive development with um, Ethiopia now diversifying away from purely uh, focusing on hydro uh, to be now the leader in uh, wind installation on the African continent uh, but what makes all of those technological developments happen is of course um, supportive legislation uh, policies we've heard uh, two of them which work quite well uh, in a number of countries which are renewable energy feed-in tariffs uh, and uh, the auctioning system or tendering which is now being applied by South Africa um, because at the end what is needed is uh, long-term financing uh, and, and there we see uh, as well uh, interesting uh, models being developed in different countries, uh, crowdfunding or pay-as-you-go schemes, again uh, an analogy to the uh, mobile sector are being used to now um, finance uh, renewable energy appliances. Um, we heard about targets because everything starts with a target. If you do not have a defined target um, in a country or in a region, you do not know um, where you're aiming to and you do not know what kind of supportive policies you need to achieve those targets. So that's a, that's a good process that many countries have learned how to draft uh, realistic targets and how to include them into the long-term vision of their country development plans. Um, yes, China being a major player on the African continent, um, mainly on hydropower but moving as well into other technologies as well, uh, which comes you know not only with the technology but with a huge support by the uh, Chinese central banks and so they have an advantage above other private uh, project developers. Uh, we heard about last but not least about uh, geothermal now being um, responsible for one-fifth of electricity generation in Kenya which is uh, fantastic to see because they've been sitting in the Rift Valley on those uh, huge untapped renewable resources uh, forever and, and now are waking up to uh, to utilize them and uh, and that uh, development ideally 
is going to spread across the whole Rift Valley in, uh, in Eastern Africa. So, um, concluding with the um, final slide, um, just mentioning uh, again that the technology is matured, it is reliable and it is uh, cost competitive. So, uh, what I would advocate for is uh, not to ask for another pilot because we know that the technology works. What we now need is scale and uh, to bring it to scale uh, we need supportive policy and um, what, what often is hindering um, indigenous domestic uh, investment in renewable energies is the um, yeah, obstructing high interest rates of uh, the national financial sector that uh, you can access low interest rates uh, loans in an international arena much more easily than a social entrepreneur uh, in an African country goes to his commercial bank and asks for a loan, especially um, recognizing the, the long um, payback periods that is the nature of the majority of renewable energy technologies that you have relatively high upfront cost but zero to very low operational cost. And that concept to, to grasp is still difficult for for many financial institutions um, and, and they are often comparing uh, apples with pears and uh, um, not seeing that uh, the high upfront costs are purchasing in terms of, of solar PV are purchasing the electricity produced for the next 30 years that you do not get a monthly bill. But that, that concept needs a lot of awareness raising and advocacy with the financial institutions as well. Um, and, and, and closing with uh, yeah, uh, an urgency to not let loose of our constant uh, pressure on the um, political decision makers because um, if we think we are on the safe side with uh, a huge investment for example in South Africa uh, and in Kenya, uh, once uh, fossil fuels are discovered, uh, unfortunately often the attention of the decision makers often turns and uh, towards more short term um, gains um, against long term sustainable development and uh, we always have to be caution of that. But um, closing that, uh, yes, 2013 was a successful year for renewables on the continent. And I'm, I'm very sure that uh, this trend will continue in 2014. Thank you very much. Well, Great. Thank you to Laura. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Sorry. No, no, no. That's fine, Sean. I'll wait for you. Oh, no. I was just going to turn it over to you. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Sean, thank you so much and good morning if you're in the US uh, and good afternoon if you're elsewhere like us in Africa. My presentation actually follows on, uh, I think, two very interesting uh, presentations from Laura and Anskar in the sense that you've seen periodically in their presentations reference to the strides that have made in renewable energy uh, in Africa and I think my presentation is really a complementary one in that it focuses very heavily on the South African market. And I'd like to take you through some of the reasons why the industry has grown so rapidly in the past few years. And in fact, if I look at Laura's slide, one of the slides, she actually references that uh, last year, in fact, South Africa was the fourth largest contributor in terms of share of GDP um, towards renewable energy. So it's, it's a tremendous stride forward. And I want to just take you through some of the rationale behind that. Now, first of all, uh, South Africa as, as a country uh, mirroring to some degree a lot of developing countries um, has a dependency on, on fossil fuels, in particular coal. We have committed in the past, of course, towards uh, reducing our consumption on, on fossil fuels, but bearing in mind that the whole sector is instrumental in creating jobs and at the same time drives an economy which up until now has been very, very energy intensive. And so it's not that easy to diversify even though the intention and the goals are there. The solution itself we know is, is no single bullet, there's no silver bullet that's going to resolve this particular issue completely. But we do know that renewable energy has a proven track record and we do know that the resources are in fact abundant, particularly in the South African context. 
So from our perspective, we felt that it was very important that we look towards renewable energy, both in the short, medium and long term, as a, a solution towards the need to diversify our energy mix. I mentioned to you the fact that in, from a renewable energy perspective, jobs are very important. Along the way, we also look at increasing energy equity, ensuring that transformation occurs at various levels throughout the infrastructure that supports the renewable energy industry. We also note that with climate change, of course, we know that South Africa is a, one of the single largest emitters. Uh, we have the single largest emitter you know, of CO2 on the planet inside of South Africa. So we know that we have a role to play in helping to mitigate against the, the increasing effects of climate change. The energy diversification issue, of course, comes about because we have an imbalance of reserves at the moment. Certainly there is enough coal to last us conceivably the next 200 years or so, depending on the quality and the pricing. But at the same time, we know that there's also a potential emerging shale gas market, which is also set to develop very shortly. So in context, South Africa wants to reduce its emissions and thereby decides that perhaps the best, object, the best means of doing that is to go down the road of renewable energy first and foremost. Of course, there are other needs that need to be uh, taken care of from an energy security supply perspective. And in that context, we're also looking at additional baseload supply, in particular coal, as well as possibly nuclear. But as I've said earlier, renewable energy remains the primary focus and you'll see to what degree South Africa has been pushing this for some time. In fact, if we can go back to 1997, when we ratified the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, certainly from our good point of view, we felt that we would be contributing in one or other way. At the same time that we were eligible for GEF funding, we felt that we would be able to contribute towards a wide variety of options that talked to climate change mitigation. We then produced our white paper on energy in 1998 and did not set a renewable energy target. And I think even when we had the World Summit on Sustainable Development in South Africa in about August of, of 2002, there was immense pressure, I think, on all countries to try and push a renewable energy target globally. Unfortunately, we weren't successful in that regard, but it did open the door for countries like South Africa to start playing a more proactive role on their own. And so after we ratified the Kyoto Protocol, we set about establishing the white paper and producing one that talks to a defined policy together with a target. And a target of 10,000 gigawatt hours was set to be realized by 2013. And it should comprise mainly biomass, wind, solar, and small-scale hydro. Now, really in Laura's presentation, I think we also touched on the fact that uh, about 6% of renewable energies in South Africa goes towards heating. Or, and, and in fact, the contribution towards heating is about 6%. And that actually comes from mainly traditional biomass. So traditional biomass in South Africa still plays a very large role in providing for the end users' energy needs. But we needed to, to fast track the development of wind and solar and also small-scale hydro to grow to about 4% of the projected electricity demand by 2013. So that's the goal that we set ourselves. And if one has to reflect on that goal, no, we did not reach the goal, and there are probably very good reasons why not. But what we did discover along the way is that, and, and we mentioned this, in fact, in the white paper, is that the appropriate financing mechanisms and incentives have to be put in place to allow for the reduction, first of all, in, in, in disincentives or subsidies that existed at the time to support fossil fuels. And we need to obviously congregate and aggregate a lot of the type of incentives that we felt could contribute towards growing the renewable energy sector. So then we set about to try and actually put in place various measures, uh, starting with the Electricity Regulation Act to assist in being able to access the grid, following that up with the Industrial Policy Action Plan to make allowances for the manufacturing of components for renewable energy. So this in itself gives you a sense of where South Africa was heading to as early as, as, the, as the early 2000s. We then embarked on a program to help define what it is that we thought we could do on the wind technology side and work together with governments such as Denmark to develop the South African Wind Energy Program, ultimately culminating in the commissioning of the Darling National Demonstration Wind Farm in 2008, and also along the way in terms of establishing uh, the revised wind atlas for South Africa, which is currently in its second phase. And we'll talk about that in a while. Also in about 2008, um, South Africa, just to reiterate its support to reducing its impact in terms of climate change, 
developed what we call the long-term mitigation scenarios work, which was approved by our cabinet. And what it proposed was a peak plateau and decline trajectory for the country. Ultimately, we were hoping that we, our emissions would peak between 2020 and 2025, flatten out for a while, and then declining in absolute terms from about 2035 onwards. And that pretty much has been the philosophy that has been adopted by government. We now have what we call the, the National Climate Change Response Strategy, and uh, the philosophy is carried forward into that response strategy. Then the, in 2008, uh, Cabinet also introduced uh, the National Energy Act, which was approved by Parliament, promulgated by the President. And under that act, it established CENEDI, which is the National Energy Development Institute, with a very specific mandate to introduce low-carbon technologies into the marketplace. Well, at about the same time, our regulator uh, introduced the first of its feed-in tariffs, the REFIT, as the program was known then. The program was then replaced by the auction process, which most of you will be familiar with. And uh, it's, it's to some degree, the jury's still out as to whether we should have abandoned the REFIT program. My personal belief is that the feed-in tariffs being far higher than the auction prices that were realized created an opportunity in the marketplace to create more opportunities for local content and to further support job creation in the sector. So I think there's, there's potentially a very good study that could be done to determine which of the two measures would have been more effective in that regard. A very important uh, policy planning tool is the integrated resource plan. And that really sets the, the guide in terms of what it is that South Africa will do when it comes to in increasing its capacity in the electricity sector. Certainly the new build program in ESCOM looks mainly at uh, introducing new coal-fired generation, but the renewable energy IPP program, which is the one which manages the auction process, that of course has its origins inside of the integrated resource plan. And for South Africa, we put forward very ambitious targets. Uh, if one looks at the goal for, for renewable energy, we anticipated that by about 2030, and we would start in the period from 2010 to 2013, that we would construct uh, of the new build, about 42% of that new build would have to come from renewable energy made up mainly of wind, PV, as well as CSP. So of, after the introduction of the uh, feed-in tariff, uh, there were some legal issues um, that were brought to our attention, mainly in the context of the role that the energy regulator plays. And it was on that basis that government then introduced the, the auction process, the competitive bidding process, in which the evaluation criteria would look largely at price, about 70% uh, being the determination, uh, and then 30% being uh, in regards of socioeconomic development, in particular looking at local content. Along the way, our, our Department of Trade and Industry, together with our Department of Energy, also felt the need to create uh, a facilitating mechanism that will allow us to develop a critical mass for renewable energies, and so established the South African Renewable Energy Initiative, or SARI. So this, and this initiative is now supported by other governments, in particular Germany, where there's been a lot of interest expressed in helping to create a, a, a better financing and facilitatory mechanism in in the context of renewable energy. So that really creates a further platform, if you like, for the introduction of renewable energy. Earlier I also mentioned to you that uh, the Wind Atlas uh, was derived from the South African Wind Energy Program. And in fact, in 2012, we then launched the, the revised uh, or verified numerical Wind Atlas for South Africa. In addition to that, our Department of Environmental Affairs, also working together with our presidency, has been looking at a green energy or SEA initiative for wind. And the whole idea is to work with uh, various local governments uh, in the determination of what we call renewable energy development zones to determine and to construct very specialized areas where we can actually go out and develop small industries around renewable energy. And that's relatively new, and it will be approved by our cabinet uh, during the course of this year. Also, we've seen uh, in this context that the renewable energy industry associations have also started to take shape, and we now have Sevilla representing the wind industry, Sastella that represents the CSP industry, Sophia the PV industry, and then Saba representing the biofuels industry. So the private sector has really been able to formalize its, its structure very well, and they're now in a position to make a meaningful contribution uh, to this industry. 
Now, just to touch very briefly on resources, I, I don't need to repeat what Ansgar has said, but certainly we do know that South Africa is one of the best solar regimes in the world, particularly in the northern parts of the country. And in fact, this is where most of the CSP plants are being built at present. But, and this is what the Wind Atlas has shown us, we also have an excellent wind energy resource. And that's just been confirmed, uh, mainly located around our coastline, scattered on the coastline. And because it's so scattered geographically, it creates an opportunity to ensure security of supply. So you've got a very good solar resource in the north and then a very good wind resource around the coastal areas and then also a world-class wave energy resource. Now this is predominantly in, in our winter months, but also along the south and west coasts. Very little in the way of tidal and also very little in the way of large hydro potential. Biomass is uh, limited because of water availability, but also because we are in the process now of looking more and more at uh, waste utilization and the supplies also to biomass as well. So the whole concept of waste to energy is now receiving more attention and in fact we're expecting to see quite a few programs being introduced in this regard. So from a technology perspective, we know that wind is very mature. There's not too much happening in the country at the moment uh, in the way of uh, further development of the technology. Uh, we've seen that most of the technologies right now that have been secured through the IPP program are in wind energy. Similarly for PV, where we're finding that uh, maybe the applications are now becoming more different. We're moving away from large grid connected systems and talking more and more about uh, rooftop PV type applications in the commercial sector, as well as uh, technologies for distributed generation, particularly in rural areas. The CSP industry is the one that offers us probably the most potential, mainly because of the storage application for trucks and receiver technology, but also at the same time because we find that we can hybridize the technology, uh, particularly for power generation as well as in certain industrial processes, particularly around things like aluminium smelting, etc. So concentrating solar power for us, very important technology. At the same time, we also think it's the most promising medium to long-term technology because we can manufacture most of the components in South Africa. There's a lot of research that's been done in wave energy converters in South Africa and we know that there is a market for it eventually but the technology is not mature at this stage and so certainly it's not being considered in our integrated resource plan. The next couple of slides really just talk to the IPP program just to share with you some of the successes of the program so far. We've uh, essentially contracted almost 4,000 megawatts uh, at present, so we've actually moved quite a far ahead of our initial application of about 3,725 megawatts in five rounds. We've just concluded our third round, in fact. So in terms of the, uh, the ministerial determination, we've actually revised it in December 2012. The minister had to introduce a further 3,200 megawatts of renewables simply because of the way in which the costs were coming down as well as the number of promising uh, projects have been brought to the table. So it's been a very successful um, case study so far. So in our, in our first bidding round, uh, bid window one, we entered into about 28 agreements under bid window two, about 19 agreements. And then of course now with respect to bid, uh, bidding round three, where we've received 93 bids, we had to make a decision with respect to the available allocation which was left. And so even though we received bits exceeding 6,000 megawatts, we had to reduce that down to about 1,400 megawatts in total. So now we've selected about uh, 17 preferred bidders. And that's, as you can see on the slide, that's the makeup of that 1,473, um, mainly, uh, well, 1,456, but mainly as uh, in the case of wind with some uh, PV and some CSP as well. So what, what's also very encouraging coming out of bid round three is the dramatic reduction in price for, from the bidders. And if you look at it, I apologize that it's in South African um, cents, but uh, just to use the context in terms of US dollars, it would be roughly about, say, seven US cents uh, per kilowatt hour for wind. And you can see it's quite dramatically down from about 11. And then similarly for PV, it's about just over nine cents, US cents per kilowatt hour and it's down from quite a high, about 27 US cents per kilowatt hour in window in, in round one. So it's, it's, it's been a dramatic improvement uh, from that perspective. Of course, as I said to you earlier, the jury's still out with respect to job creation opportunities. So this just gives you a breakdown of the, um, of the various contributors uh, for, the, for the three bidding rounds. 
as you can see that we've uh, commissioned a contract at about 1,456 megawatts, which for a country like South Africa coming off a zero base in essentially 2012, this is a remarkable stride forward in, in a very short period of time. So we have about 2,800 megawatts that still has to be um, contracted, and so we're now moving into round four, and then followed by round five before further determinations will be made. Just to touch on biofuels very briefly, this is one area where there's a slight contention uh, with respect to the nature of the, of the crops that will be used for biofuels. South Africa has, as early as 2008, uh, proposed its own biofuel strategy. We've now reached the point where regulations have been passed, which looks at a 2% a two penetration, or 400 million liters per annum, um, that has to be produced uh, in context of bioethanol and biodiesel and that certain food crops uh, can be used, in particular sugarcane, sugar beets, soybeans, canola and sunflower. Uh, in the case of, of bioethanol, we believe that government is more pro-grain sorghum, so we're expecting more projects to be introduced that use grain sorghum as feedstock for bioethanol. In addition to that, we're also looking at uh, reducing the levy that's applicable to these fuels and reducing the biofuel uh, levy from about 40 to 50 percent and then looking at a 100% reduction in the levy for bioethanol. So historically, and this is after 2008, we did introduce um, some of these exemptions and they proved to be ineffective in actually stimulating the development of the sector. What's starting to work now in our favor is that this 2% penetration that has been passed through regulation is now mandatory. So you're now seeing a mandatory blend that has to be introduced around the country and unfortunately, it has to be done that way because of the nature of the industry where our, our existing oil companies uh, get paid more in South Africa for their mineral fuel than they do um, if they went uh, outside of South Africa. So I'm not going to spend too much time on this other than to say that the whole idea behind the pricing is to make sure, and this was done in, in, in 2011, was to finalize the subsidy principles and to make sure that we have drafted the regulations that I've just spoken to you about. The blending regulations uh, that were introduced in, in August of 2012 uh, looked at anything from a, a B5, 5% biodiesel up to 100% biodiesel and a 2% ethanol up to a 10% ethanol blend uh, being acceptable in our fuel mix and that's been promulgated if you like through the gazetting in, on the 15th of January of this year. So we are moving towards biofuels, albeit very slowly. The whole notion, and, and Ansgar has mentioned it, of the energy, food and water nexus uh, is a critical determinant in deciding how fast to move ahead with the biofuel sector. And because food security plays such a critical role uh, in the South African context, it's certainly something that the government is taking very seriously. So there are some barriers um, to a more rapid deployment, and even though we, I've just mentioned to you how fast we are moving, on the policy and incentive side, more has to be done in terms of localization. That's, that's the hymn that we keep on seeing that applies to skills. It supports for R&D. It also means that we need to pilot and demonstrate new technology, particularly on the wave energy side and waste to energy, where we think that there's still some research work that's possible and needs to be demonstrated. Raising awareness and getting customers to shift um, to cleaner energy in terms of their, their own uh, choice that they have in the, in the electricity supply and then also to make sure that norms and standards are introduced. One of my last slides really just looks at the renewable energy outlook and says that uh, based on the success of the IPP program, we need to of course see more in the way of socioeconomic development and localization, but that the rapid growth of the market has created an underlying industry which is now starting to take shape. The implementa implementation of the Renewable Energy Initiative, sorry, is creating more and more market certainty in the country. So that's a very good thing because now investors are more and more keen to invest in the country. There's also more work that's been done in terms of the practical renewable energy potential, uh, lots of ongoing uh, uh, resource assessments that are, that are now contributing to a better understanding of the resource. And now we also with ministerial determinations, we have more capacity confer uh, be, uh, being confirmed uh, and, and also reducing uh, intermittency issues uh, through energy storage. Just to talk about grid availability firstly, and we have a supply constraint environment at the moment, but we needed to make sure that we have not only a steady supply of electricity from renewable energy, but that also that we could have a grid that was capable of dealing with renewable energy and that introduces the smart grids work which we're busy with. Also to consider the fact that in a water scarce country like South Africa, we had to uh, push very hard for a, a more constrained use of water 
and therefore dry cooling, particularly for CSP, is a preferred option. Um, further work that's required, of course, would be to look at uh, more policy and regulatory frameworks for self-generation, to look at the willing buyer, willing sell, uh, seller model, and then also to look at the whole net metering environment, particularly where we have rooftop PV and there are customers that need to sell that power back into the grid. And of course, the last point is we are learning by doing and we encourage everyone to keep doing this because really the only way we could develop a lot of these issues is by getting stuck in at the deep end into this equation. The last thing I wanted to mention to you is the whole uh, CIRIC of 2015. I think it was on Laura's last slide as well. So South Africa is very fortunate to be uh, selected as the host country for the IRIC, the International Renewable Energy Conference, next year. It follows on the success of the first IRIC, which was held in Bonn in 2004, and really created a global platform for the rapid deployment of renewable energy. Previous IRICs have been held around the world, in particular in China, US, India, and Abu Dhabi. We are aiming to have a global event. Uh, it's mainly uh, government orientated, but also a multi-stakeholder uh, event. So it will be global in its scope, but at the same time, we are looking at addressing developmental challenges uh, in sub-Saharan Africa and other emerging economies. And then lastly, just to note that it will be held in Cape Town, so I can't think of a better venue uh, from the 4th uh, to the 7th of October. So on that note, uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Great. Thank you, Kevin, and thank you also, Laura and Ansar, for the uh, great presentations this morning. Um, and at this point, we will be moving on to the question and answer session where we'll address any questions from the audience. And uh, before we begin, I just want to remind the audience that if you do have any questions for the panelists, uh, please feel free to submit those through the question pane in the GoToWebinar uh, window. And so uh, now we'll move on to the first questions I've received from the audience. And, uh, Laura and Ansar and Kevin, if uh, you'd like to answer the question, please just go ahead and uh, jump right in. If we have two people uh, talk at once, then we'll, we'll figure it out from there. Um, and so the first question asks, um, how to get real support to start moving the renewable energy sector in, the, uh, in African countries? Is it by developing demonstration projects? Um, or to get funds to start real projects, especially in rural areas? Um, hi, this is Laura from REN21. I'll, I'll start, but, but maybe Angsar can, can complement it. I mean, how to get things started? It, it's not it's not one magic bullet. Um, from our side, from the REN21 side, and the work that we've been doing, the policy the policies um, that are put in place are really important. The policies that establish R and D um, incentives or protocols, they're there in place to you know indicate that there's a market available for those developments for those projects. So. Um, Maybe my other two colleagues can, can comment on the more technical side, but at least from, from our perspective, it really is the national policy environment that can do a lot to get those projects um, up and running. Right, yeah. Um, maybe if I can add to that, uh, especially as you mentioned, uh, uh, rural areas, uh, I would always start with evaluation of the demand, because by knowing who wants electricity for what should be your basis to develop uh, um, a concept for it and and then establishing as well uh, within the community um, the ability and the willingness to pay for the energy services I think that's that's another crucial element so if you know how much electricity or slash energy you you it is it is asked for uh, and how much um, people are willing and able to pay you for that then you have a good basis to develop your um, your your project based on that, and uh, and ideally can then approach um, yeah national and international financial institutions and, and project developers. Thanks, uh, and Scott, if I could just come in there as well, um, just to just put in my little bit of uh, wisdom into that from a South African context. I think what I've learned over the past few years is that. One of the things you need to do is set up a critical mass. I think that's the important thing for me because you don't start a bonfire by lighting flares. You need to build up critical mass of technology. And we've seen that there are many wonderful 
demonstration type projects and, and how many of them have never seen the light of day and they haven't crossed the great technology value of death divide for various reasons. So a critical mass is important. The second thing is SMEs. In South Africa we look more and more at small medium uh, enterprises as a way to actually increase penetration of technologies into in particular rural communities. So we see that as a vital component where the technology can be introduced at the SME level you, see, you tend to find the penetration levels are higher. And lastly from a rural point of view, the technologies themselves, the solutions must be aspirational. For people that are living in rural areas, they always aspire to live in urban areas getting the same quality of service as those people more fortunate to live in, in, in urban areas. So one always has to consider that we don't develop pro-poor technologies. We develop technologies that are aspirational and that people should actually aspire to want to participate in own technologies in that light. Thank you, everyone. Uh, and moving on now to the next question, this one's specific to South Africa, and it asks, how can manufacturing be leveraged locally in South Africa for export, export to the rapidly growing market in the rest of Africa? Thanks, Sean. I think that's a very important question. In fact, when I, when I spoke in my presentation earlier, I mentioned to you how we saw manufacturing as being key towards stimulating socioeconomic upliftment. And from our perspective, there are various technologies, in particular CSP, which I think offers uh, the biggest potential to help reduce costs. We're never going to be manufacturing PV cells in the next five to ten years nor are we going to be doing large-scale blade manufacturing. Well, I could be wrong, but from a, from a CSP perspective, the heliostats, the trackers, the, um, the towers themselves, the fluted um, tube heat exchangers can all be manufactured not only in South Africa, but certainly in the region. And so a regionally integrated program is the way to go to help bring those costs down. In fact, there are various countries, uh, particularly in Southern Africa, that can produce the low iron gloss that's uh, required in, in certain heliostats. So we know that the potential does exist. South Africa does see itself as a manufacturing hub because of the availability of iron and steel inside of South Africa together with some of the glass components. So there's every, every reason to believe that one could set up the manufacturing uh, uh, hub here put in place the necessary incentive supporting industry's uh, application here and then exporting that into the region. On the biofuel side, we see it somewhat differently. We see that the region could provide the feedstock and maybe we set up the uh, manufacturing of, of the fuels inside of South Africa, uh, but the feedstock itself would come from the rest of, of Southern Africa. Great, thank you. Um, and the next question we have is, what are the value chains chains that can be exploited and highlighted for SMMEs in the African context? And then thinking along the lines of combining cutting edge mobile technology, opportunities for leapfrogging traditional energy systems and rethinking the notion of electricity generation versus energy supply. So again, the question is, what are the value chains that can be exploited and highlighted for SMMEs in the African context. Should I just have a go first? Um, this is Kevin. Yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Kevin. Uh, uh, okay, I'll I'll start it from a South African context. I think each each environment is slightly unique in, in many ways. What I've what I've discovered from the um, South African context, and borrowing to some degree from the Barefoot College experience in India, is that the whole assembly of PV installation and the maintenance around PV creates a great opportunity for SMME development. Now, in the South African context, we're looking at different value chains, yes, uh, and that would apply, for instance, to waste where one could collect, in particular, uh, parks waste, uh, which is biomass mainly, uh, invasive vegetation, um, and along the way some uh, solid, municipal solid waste, etc., and then transport that, of course, um, to a more centralized facility where one can do uh, various conversion processes, for instance, pyrolysis, gasification, or uh, 
uh, just depends on, on what the requirement is. So there's definitely a mechanism when it comes to harvesting or collecting of waste, transporting that waste, and then ultimately possibly even being involved in some of the uh, transformational conversion processes. The other value chains, for instance, kits that we're looking at for um, the dissemination, uh, or firstly the manufacturing and then dissemination of small wind turbines, for instance, particularly wooden uh, wind turbines, where there are many models out there that can be used to actually construct these. So it just depends on the application and where you find the opportunity. South Africa has just set up its own SME department at the national government level with the uh, with a specific mandate to go out there and actually develop an enabling environment for these SMEs. And so a lot of proposals like this are being taken to them for screening so that one can come up with a, a, a mechanism that could be supported with various incentives initially, but then could be taken over by the private sector and run uh, on a competitive market basis. So from our perspective, um, it simply depends on the type of environment that you're in and what type of technology works best in that context. And then from there, we'll be looking at various options. Like I said, we're not going to be manufacturing PV cells in South Africa very soon. So we are more interested in the assembly part and then the after installation, maintenance, things like that. Thanks again, Kevin. Uh, and we have time for one more question. Um, and the question, the last one actually that we received is, uh, what are the biggest lessons around the socio-economic development from South Africa's renewable energy independent power producer procurement program? All right. Well, I think one of the important things to note is that each and every contract that is signed has got a clause in it that uh, talks to socio-economic upliftment. So a certain percentage of profit has to be spent on uh, socio-economic upliftment. So that money has to go into the community. Uh, which is the target uh, community for that particular technology, so that's factored into the contract. It's a little bit early to actually um, pinpoint exactly what benefits there have been because a lot of technologies have only been commissioned very recently or are in the process of being commissioned right now. Another important consideration in the evaluation side is that at least 30% had to come from local content. So there has been uh, that uh, condition imposed on projects as well. That has been somewhat less than satisfactory, and the reason for that is that a lot of auxiliary and ciliary type services were included in the contracts that could be supplied by South Africans, uh, legal services in some cases, um, some of the um, consulting work, uh, pro uh, project management work, uh, environmental studies that were required were done by local consultants, and very little in the way of actual construction and also along the way in terms of the manufacturing of components. And so governments had to rethink to some degree its definition of local content. And because of that, we're starting to see, and you'll see that in our, in our fourth building round, for instance, that more and more emphasis is now being placed on local content. In fact, our um, Industrial Development Corporation, the IDC, uh, did not accept uh, projects uh, from bidders who did not have local PV uh, in them. Now, we don't manufacture, as I said, but we do have uh, thin film technology that has been developed uh, in partnership with Germany. That technology is available through our German partners, but could have been used in the South African context. And so they've now become more aware of the need to restrict themselves to financing projects uh, that have a local PV component to them. So I think you're going to start seeing more and more of that moving forward. But in, just in short, just to, to, to just conclude my response, the communities themselves haven't benefited tremendously thus far. There are one or two cases like um, the, the uh, Taos River community in the Western Cape where uh, most of the labor force that's being used on a CPV plant, a concentrated PV plant, comes from the area. So there we've seen some, um, some uh, tremendous growth in terms of jobs uh, in that sector. But the same can't be said for all where many they've been short-term jobs during construction and not much in the way of longer-term sustainable jobs. So I hope that answers the question to some degree. It's a little bit premature to be looking at the longer term socioeconomic benefits to the community as a whole, but I, I must just stress that more needs to be done and will be addressed through the next bidding rounds. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Thank you to uh, the rest of the panelists, Ansar and Laura as well. Uh, now we'd like to just wrap up with a quick survey for the audience. Uh, we just have three short questions for you to answer that helps us evaluate how we're doing and improve for our future webinars. Uh, Heather, display that first question, please. 
And the question is, the webinar content provided me with useful information and insight. Good, and the next question. The webinar's presenters were effective. And the final question, overall the webinar met my expectations. Great, thank you very much for answering our survey. Um, and on behalf of the Clean Energy Solutions Center, I do just want to again thank uh, each of our panelists for the presentations today and for the, the great question and answer session. And uh, also to our attendees for uh, joining us today. And I'd like to remind you that if you'd like to listen to um, the webinar again or view the slides um, or share it with others within your networks and organizations, we will be posting a recording at cleanenergysolutions.org forward slash training. And we also uh, post our webinars now to the Clean Energy Solutions Center YouTube page. That is the bottom link, uh, youtube.com forward slash user forward slash clean energy policy. And you can view it out there as well. Um, and so with that, I just want to thank everyone again uh, and welcome you to go check out the Clean Energy Solutions Center to again view this webinar or any other webinars that we've held. And with that, I hope everyone has a great rest of your day. And this concludes our webinar.